For the past 20 years, two adopted brothers have been missing, and for 10 of those years, the most horrific secret was kept. The sibling of the family that these boys were adopted into would later say that they were forbidden to mention that Austin and Edward even existed. What occurred to them? Is it really as sad as our gut feeling is telling us? Why were these parents never charged with their disappearance? You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna and today's case is a very important one to me. If you guys watch this channel, you know it's another one of those horror stories that has come from the foster system, from adoption. We're going to dive into just how much the kids slip through the foster system, especially even after adoption, and the fact that five kids were adopted by these allegedly abusive parents when two of their other children were already missing and nobody even noticed. As the only justice given was given to the state for the loss of money rather than for the lives that were lost and traumatized forever. I will always link that playlist down below about all of these kinds of similar stories of adoption and foster care as well as my own personal experience with foster care and adoption and just the fact that I know way too much about all of this really just lights a fire for me to want to spread the word and just keep that reminder to everyone that this is a very, very broken system and there are very small steps being taken to reform it, if any. I also want to thank Pinecone for sponsoring this video. Pinecone allows you to review different products. They are one of the top product review sites where you can earn cash as well as gift cards. You can give feedback on brands and products as well as testing them. But Pinecone is invite only and my link is the way to get in. If you are a student, a stay at home mom, someone who loves to give opinions on new products, or someone who just wants to make a little extra income, this is absolutely perfect. It's super, super easy. All you do is have your email, put in Pinecone, they send you different surveys and reviews to do, and then you are earning cash as well as gift cards. So it's really amazing. Just make sure you click my link down below if you want to be invited. Like I said, it's invite only and you don't want to miss out. So click down below. I also want to let you guys know that you can listen to me on the go now. Many of you guys have asked me for a podcast throughout the years so you can be anywhere watching it or listening to it and so that is what you can do on Spotify just search motives and malice with Brooke McKenna and I should come up and I would be so grateful if you would go and give it a five-star review and follow it and just kind of follow me on there and and see if you like being able to take it anywhere you go so let me know now let's get back to the story So it was 2000 in Colorado and the Bryant family lived in El Paso County. Now this was 58 year old Edward and 54 year old Linda who lived in Granite Circle. And that March, they would adopt two of their foster children, four year old Austin and seven year old Edward. Now Edward had brown hair, brown eyes and had been born Dellen Levi Bennett. He was diagnosed with ADHD and was on the medication Ritalin for this. Now he had actually been renamed from Dylan to Edward after adoption, which he was actually said to dislike. He didn't want to be named after his adopted father, who was also obviously named Edward. And he allegedly even began to cuss and yell at the adoptive parents saying that his name was Dylan. And this is just a glimpse into the horrors that these boys were feeling at this time, but Austin had blonde hair, blue eyes, and had been born Austin, but spelled differently, Gene Bennett. He wore thick glasses and their adoption would be finalized, but it would be the beginning of the end for them. Though these horrors would be kept secret for the next 11 years. So 11 years later, on January 22nd of 2011, the El Paso County Sheriff's Office would be contacted by a few boys, teens, you know, young adults, and they were actually worried about their childhood friend, Austin. They said that he suddenly disappeared with no explanation all the way back in 2003. He hadn't been seen in those eight years since these friends were coming forward, and so when investigators looked into this, they found that Austin's brother, 
Edward had also gone missing, allegedly two years prior to Austin in 2001. The adopted parents had never reported either boy missing. Now, there had been a report made on April 6th of 2002, and this was about Austin, who the parents believed had run away when he was around six years old. The police in the area, they were quick to search, they used helicopters, they canvassed the area, and not long after the search began, Austin actually came out of some bushes right next to the home that he lived in and their garage and he was saying that he was so scared because of all the commotion happening that he didn't want to come out but there was no statement as to why Austin ran away you know he was returned to his family and this was the only report ever made of the boys running away or being missing or not being in the home now these witnesses who came forward 11 years after the boys were adopted were actually found to be Ricky and Brian Pennington who were actually also foster children themselves but at that time were placed in the care of Linda's biological daughter who was also a foster parent. She was much older than most of the kids and she was also the foster parent and so they would often hang out with her mother's foster kids as well or adopted kids including Austin and Edward. Now around the time that these two brothers Ricky and Brian would come forward they had actually said they went out to lunch one day and Brian started talking about their childhood friend Austin and Ricky didn't remember that he had vanished but he told Brian he probably needed to go to the police. Now by this time of everything coming out the brothers would have been 15 and 18 years old and their adoptive parents Edward and Linda were separated by this point. They had moved to Texas but they were currently living in different cities and they had also adopted five more children after that who still lived with their mother during the week and their father on the weekends and one child that they also had was in the army and the other one was incarcerated at this time they had adopted nine kids in total and then Linda had this biological daughter as well now, something that's not mentioned a lot is that Austin and Edward actually had a younger brother who was also adopted by the Bryants as well, but he could be accounted for during this time, so not much is really known about them. However, none of the kids that they could locate were Austin or Edward. In fact, the other seven children were accounted for, so Austin and Edward seemed to be the only ones missing. And on February 25th of 2011, Edward and Linda were arrested on two counts of felony theft conspiracy and multiple counts of forgery and attempt to influence a public official. By March 4th, they were extradited back to Colorado. You see, the more they were questioned about these brothers' disappearance, Linda first said that they were away from Texas and they actually went to visit their biological mother in Oklahoma. Linda would later confess, though, that they had not lived with her in years because they had run away back in 2003 and 2005, but they ran away together sometime during that time. She couldn't even specifically remember the time, but their father Edward said that they had also ran away, but that it was separate and that Edward ran away in 2001 and Austin in 2003, meaning that Edward was around nine years old and Austin was between seven and nine when they both vanished. Both Linda and Edward claimed that the boys wanted to be with the biological mother and so they ran away to be with her. However, on top of the problem that these boys were never seen again, these parents continued to receive a monthly payment of $1,700 for the care of the two boys due to them being adopted and having special needs. Now, subsidy is something that can be given to adoptive families who have chosen to adopt children who say are in a group, a sibling group, that the foster care system does not want to separate and there are less people willing to adopt a whole sibling group or say they have special needs and need more medical care subsidy helps with the costs of the children. But in order to keep the payments coming, the family actually has to create documents proving that the boys live in the home each month and that they're having an education of some sort. And this is because up until 18 years old, or when they graduate, those payments continue coming. These documents had never stopped being turned in and the money never stopped coming because there was actually no requirement that the boys be seen. And there was even an interview every three years that the parents had to go in and you know talk to somebody about this to continue their subsidy payments, but the boys didn't have to go. And so the Bryants passed every single time and continued to receive money. And all the way back in 2003, instead of reporting Edward missing, Medicaid was actually billed on his behalf. And Austin had also been enrolled in school 
until that year of 2003 when he was said to be transferred to homeschool. However, that is the year that most of the records of any medical care or any schooling really ceased. However, in 2010, documents did emerge that claimed that Edward was going to be graduating from this homeschool online academy in June of 2011 though it cannot be confirmed that this is a real school and it's believed that it was just a made up one, it means that Linda was trying to get payments even after Edward would have turned 18 if he was with her. You see, because if Edward was still going to school past his 18th birthday, any of those months past the 18th birthday, he would still be getting paid even though the normal cutoff was 18. So she was trying to get even more money. Now, the total amount that these parents had gotten from subsidy for, from their children was kind of announced in 2007 when they had filed for bankruptcy and listed $126,125 in adoption benefits for their income. They also listed Austin and Edward as dependents, but it turned out that even after 2007, they were collecting money for these missing children. And by the time that they were arrested, they had gotten around $175,000 in benefits from them. Edward denied knowing about any of these benefits or that they were still making money. And Linda at first, you know, didn't want to confess anything, but then she ultimately did say that she kept the payments coming in by covering up the disappearances. And they were held on a $1 million bond for welfare fraud. And Linda was found living in this very pretty gated community near a lake and a golf course. She was living large on the money that her missing adopted boys were making her. But after speaking to Austin and Edward's adopted siblings, Investigators knew that there was more to this story. You see, they were told by their siblings that they were forbidden to talk about their brothers at all. And the problem was, Austin and Edward's adoption was finalized. They were no longer foster children and social workers no longer had to be involved with a family or responsible for their well-being anymore. So when they vanished, nobody was said to see a thing except for the other children. And they said that their parents still made it seem as though the brothers lived there. In fact, Linda, their mother, would print out Google photos of different boys at different ages and say that it was Austin and Edward as they were growing up. She would put them up in her home as though they were her children. Now, specifically their adopted brother, James, which some people say is... Austin and Edward's biological brother as well. He was the one in the army at the time of all of this. He would tell the most to investigators. And he would say that although he hadn't been able to talk about his brothers for years, he remembered what they had been through. He claimed that Austin, who was the one who was four at the time of the adoption, was beaten, he was denied food, and he would often eat out of a garbage can because he was so hungry. He was allegedly handcuffed, locked in a garage for days where they would hear him yelling and running back and forth. And he also saw Austin wrapped up tightly in blankets. He was just stuffed in there so he couldn't move. And the parents, Linda and Edward, said this is what a therapist told them to do. Now, James said that once Austin even told him that he had been locked in a trunk and shocked with a taser, but James hadn't seen this to confirm it. Now, when it came to Edward, who was adopted at seven years old, James said he never even met Edward. He was told that Edward was sent to relatives in Arizona and he didn't even know anything about him. Friends of Austin's from back then would claim that they often saw him covered in welts with black eyes and cuts on his face. So Linda was charged with 148 felonies and Edward with 13. Though even with the statements of this alleged abuse of the children, the fact that they were never reported missing and still currently missing there were no charges for Austin and Edward's disappearance among those felonies. Both parents denied abusing them or killing them. There were seriously no charges being brought against them for any of it, even though at this time, investigators did believe that they were looking at a homicide and looking for bodies. Now, the five children that they had adopted after these boys had gone missing, they were turned back into wards of the state. They went back to foster care after being adopted into what they thought was a good loving home and then having to be thrown back into the system. Now, investigators did begin searching the area that Austin and Edward had vanished in, the home that they had once been living in. They used search dogs and satellite imagery because they were actually using the area's topography to see if anything had changed, you know, if anyone had been buried in the area. Neighbors who were neighbors of the the 
Bryant family back then said they didn't even notice when the children went missing, that the family they thought was shady, but they didn't even know that these two boys had never been seen again. On March 10th of 2011, a press conference was held by the Sheriff Terry McKetta, and he was saying that they were just trying to get the word out in hopes somebody who knew the Bryans back then would come forward about what really happened to get more information. They were working with the FBI as well as the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. He was asked if he believed the boys are still alive. And he said, each day that passes, the faith of finding them alive diminishes. At the time, they were considering this an ongoing homicide investigation. And he was saying that he can't speak for the you know, state agency, the foster care in charge of overseeing the adoption, but that the system clearly did not work in this case, which I'm so glad that he was very vocal about. He said at this point, they don't even have a crime scene to work with. There was only a paper trail of fraud and forgery, and that was it. I mean, it had been so long, they literally moved states. The other children had been growing up who had lived with them at that time. You know, the, the children that they had adopted after the boys went missing, who knows if they even knew about these two. And so by January of 2012, the Bryants would go to trial. Though there were still no charges surrounding what happened to Austin and Edward, but their mother Linda would plead guilty and was sentenced to 42 years for the fraud and forgery charges. And she also had admitted to delaying food to the boys as a punishment, as well as moving away from that home for a fresh start after what they did which wasn't elaborated on. Many relatives of the Bryants, especially Linda, would testify as to what Linda had told them throughout the years as to where the boys had gone. One story was that Edward was sent to boot camp for bad behavior, that Austin was sent to an insane asylum in Colorado, and one relative heard all of this and allegedly sent a complaint to the El Paso County Department of Human Services after Edward vanished. The caseworker was never sent. So they were going to send one out and as it so happens, Linda had asked James, one of her other sons, if he would bring over one of his friends who was a boy who could pretend to be Edward. This caseworker never ended up coming out. They didn't reschedule anything. No one actually went out to examine any of this. But Linda did have a plan. Now, their father, Edward, also pled guilty and was sentenced to 30 years after 19 of his charges were dismissed. But prosecutors believe that Linda played a much bigger role in hiding the fact that the boys were gone in order to continue to be paid. Because you have to remember, this case was not a case about murder, about their disappearance, neglect, abuse. This was strictly about the money that they had stolen. Edward did admit, though, that he had signed different documents stating that the kids were in their care to keep the payments coming. But Linda, shockingly, offered to take on all of the charges they could give her if they would let Edward go so he could take care of their other children. She even brought up manslaughter charges, which no one had even, you know, charged her for or brought it up. She brought this up herself, saying that she would take manslaughter charges if he would be released. Now, like I said, seven other children were adopted by this family. It's unknown how many were adopted after the brothers, though the five still living in the home had to be younger than the brothers to be still living there, meaning that CPS had been involved with this family after the brothers had gone missing, and every social worker completely missed the fact that two of their children weren't there, ever. For around 10 years, nobody noticed. I mean, there's supposed to be home studies, visitations, check-ins when it comes to foster care before an adoption can even occur. Was this neglected due to the fact that the Bryants had already adopted? And so, you know, the social workers didn't feel like there was a need to really dive in and thoroughly make sure they were doing everything they needed to do? Or was this just pure laziness on the foster system's part? It's so interesting because for some families, who want to become foster parents, CPS makes it extremely difficult to begin the process. It becomes almost a constant, obsessive, watchful eye of these families in order to become foster parents or adoptive parents because, you know, they need to be to the highest standard. And yet, when it comes to some families, there's zero observation at all, and they're just thrown these kids, and no one ever looks at them twice. CPS seems to have a long history of lazy work when it comes to the continued safety of these children. And no matter how many times that they say they're going to fix it or they're called out, they do nothing. We have not seen any big enough changes to make an impact 
in decades. Now, Austin and Edward's biological mother was named Mary Hyder, and she actually would come forward to tell a bit of her story and how the boys ended up in foster care and adopted. She was saying that she relinquished custody of her sons in the late 1990s because she was accused of neglect by their school, and she also would often sleep when the boys were awake. Mary said that she just wanted to give them a better life than she could give them, and so that's why she decided to give them up. She was said to have some very horrific things happen to her when she was younger, and so she was diagnosed with depression and PTSD, and after having three children and being diagnosed with all this, put on medication for that, this medication was making her very sleepy, which is why she was often asleep when the kids were awake, and that she should have been awake, but she couldn't be. Now, the reason for the boys actually being taken was due to the accusation from the school claiming that one of the boys had a bite mark on their legs that looked like abuse. Mary said that they lived right next to a dog kennel and that the boys loved to play with the dogs and that the mark was either a dog bite or a mosquito bite, but CPS didn't listen and took the boys away. Now, when Austin and Edward had gone to the Bryants as foster children, Mary was still able to have visitation. She would see them once during the week and she would take them to McDonald's and she would see them on the weekends as well. She would often call and talk to them anytime she wanted. And it appeared as though she was doing her best to get them back, but also at the same time happy that they were in a loving, stable environment. And she believed that the Bryants were great parents who loved her boys just as much as she did. And so by the next year, the Bryants actually asked Mary if they could adopt her son. They asked for this. And so Mary loved her kids, but Mary knew that they deserved a family that was stable and that had a mother and a father. That's her belief. And so with the boys seeming to be loving their new home and she was still able to communicate with them, she agreed to let them adopt them. Her attorney had also told her it was going to be very hard to beat the case and it was better if she signed her rights away. And so Mary would do so. But she would say that her son, Dylan, who would then be turned into Edward, had a speech impediment that she loved and that she would also affectionately call Austin her little Einstein because he was so smart. But after Mary signed her rights away, that's when she said that everything changed because she would call to talk to Edward and he was suddenly not home or not available to come to the phone. And as the adoption got closer, Mary couldn't reach the boys at all and the Bryants began telling her not to call. This was December of 1999 and at that point, there was nothing she could do. She had given up her rights and the adoption was going to be finalized in early 2000. Now at the time of the arrest, like I said, Linda was very adamant that the boys had run away to their biological mother, Mary. But Mary said she hasn't seen them since 1999 when they went to the Bryants. She's also so horrified that she gave up her sons in hopes of giving them a better life and they were given the complete opposite. Now, age progress photos have been released of what the boys may look like. Now, I think that these are a few years old, but they are, you know, more grown up than what the kids that vanished would look like. So I will show them to you, but Linda and Edward have never been charged with their abuse or the possible homicide of Austin and Edward. Every charge was for welfare fraud, the money that was stolen, as though the money was more important than the lives of these boys who were never even found. And horrific enough, two parents who had never reported two children missing still were able to adopt five more children who they had been vetted, chosen, and given because they were trusted by the foster system and by social workers. It's baffling to me. It makes me very, very angry. Where, where were the social workers? Did they always just take the excuse that the boys were not home? Did anybody write this down to keep logs of this? That is something that I have noticed about these cases that there is not a lot of paperwork being written up. So, you know, one social worker goes, they get an excuse. Well, they didn't write it down. So the next social worker goes, gets a different excuse and they have no idea that the first one existed. So they don't write it down either. And it just continues because there is no follow-up. There is no documentation of what is happening. It seems like that would be a social worker problem. But they, at the end of the day, they are so burnt out, so overrun by a system that just does not work that it's not necessarily their fault either. It's a system that at the core needs changing. And until that core changes, the people all the way out here with no power, 
like the social workers, how are they supposed to fix anything? This case makes foster families and adoptive families seem horrific. And as the daughter of a former foster family and of an adoptive family, that's a very hard stigma for me to talk about. And for that to be, you know, the light that's shown on foster care families and adoptive families, because there are some really good ones out there. However, I think this case shows that bad foster families have to be accepted by Child Protective Services, by the foster care system. And they're only accepted if the foster system doesn't do their job. Linda and Edward Bryant might be responsible for the disappearances or possible homicide of Austin and Edward, but CPS is as much to blame for the negligence and the lack of effort to change the core of the system or to even acknowledge these boys and their existence. 23 years after their adoption, these boys have still not been found and Linda continues to serve her sentence, whereas Edward is now currently out on parole. If you have any information, please contact the El Paso County Sheriff's Office at 719-390-5555. It is very important that we figure out what happened to these boys. These boys went from a system that does not, did not care about them into a home that was supposed to care about them. And when that didn't happen, the family, nor the system, nor really the police did anything to show any sort of care. I will say, I know that we most likely know what happened as far as, you know, whether they're dead or alive. There is still hope out there that they did run away, that they hated their new adoptive family, that they were not being treated right, and that somehow they survived maybe just the two of them, they are somewhere today not wanting to be found. I also want to acknowledge the trauma that their siblings must have gone through, if not being abused, because we don't know if everyone was abused. We don't know really all of the information about that. But we do know that they were forbidden to talk about their own siblings. They witnessed abuse. They were most likely manipulated into believing that these siblings were still there with the photos on the wall with their mom constantly getting money for them and there was a lot that these other foster care children and adopted children had to go through an experience as well and that also needs to be acknowledged and it's so almost disgusting that the justice system was for the money and not for the boys essentially they could have gotten away with murder. Let me know all you think about this case and don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.